so you can ask questions to her. Nick, come up. They're not moving. We're going to wait one more minute. This one person moving up. <laughs> Here's my student. <laughs> He's obligated to move. You guys want to move up a little bit? Yeah, we have a lot of empty chairs over here. Yeah, they were standing at the back, just walk up. Ajani Kapon, you need to pressure your students to walk up. I know that they're all your students back there. Please move them. So uh, good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to day four of MLRS, and I'm Super Sansu Watanakorn from Vistec. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce a very good friend of mine, Sarah Hooker. She's here, and um, so currently Sarah is a, a a director at Cohere, like a Canadian startup which provides advanced NLP products and services. She also leads a nonprofit research called Cohere for AI, which also helps sponsor. MLRS school. So before, before joining Cohere, uh, she was a research scientist at Google, working on various topics like interpretability, algorithmic bias, fairness, and now LLM large language models, and, and especially efficiency in LLM. Um, she, she also founded so many things that I need a list. So she founded Delta Analytics, uh, a Bay Area nonprofit that, you know, aims, I think, I describe it correctly, trying to build like a technical capability for people around the world. She also co-founded Trustworthy ML Initiative and also serves on advisory boards for Kaggles and Patterns and also a member of, of um, the World Economic Council on the future of AI. So um, personally, I think she's very fun to talk to and she's incredibly curious about everything, including people. And to me, that's like a really hallmark for a good, like a great scientist. Um, and I'm a secret admirer of her, which is apparently no longer a secret, but I highly encourage you guys to chat to her. And she'll be with us again on the panels on Monday. And I think you guys want me to stop talking, so I'll, I'll, I'll give the stage to her now. Um, please welcome Sarah Hooker. So I'm going to put this here. So hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hi. 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 <laughs> so we have quite some time today, so I'd like to start with something crucial. Can everyone stand up? <laughs> and can everyone stretch up? And to this side. And to that side. And move around in full twist. Find your neighbor and give them a high five. <laughs> <laughs> so now we can begin. So please sit down, be comfortable. <laughs> so um, I think today I'm actually going to cover a few things. The idea that I have is that maybe I'll give you a sampler platter of things that I find interesting right now. And we're going to have two parts to this talk, but uh, I think crucially let's keep it free flowing throughout. So I'm actually going to pick on the people in the back for questions. So. If you, uh, you think you've avoided it, but I'm intentionally, so wait for the shout outs. But in general, let's, uh, if you have questions, sew them out and let's see how we do. My main goal is to just tell you maybe what I'm thinking about right now and what interests me as problems, because I think some of the benefits of a summer school are to get exposed to maybe ideas that you haven't thought about or sampled and to kind of maybe be a starting point for your own interests. So I started out with part one, which is understanding the role of data, scale, and capacity in recent breakthroughs, because I think this is very timely. We're in a very exciting time for research. But to begin with, maybe I'll just share a bit more. Um, it's hard to beat that introduction. Uh, so I lead Cohere4AI, so we're a research lab. We do a lot of work on 
um, really models at scale. Um, we have a full-time research staff as well as an open science initiative, so we do a lot of open science collaborations. Um, we also, I guess this is our, our team, um, and then these are the scholars. I thought I'd briefly mention that we have the scholars program, so if you're also interested in that, please chat to me. Like the scholars is a full-time paid uh, program that starts in January next year, and you get to work with top-tier researchers, you have access to compute, and it's an industry setting scholars program. So definitely feel free to chat to me afterwards if that's interesting to you. Um, and I'm here throughout the week. Um, so, oh, excellent, nice, lots of people taking photos, great. Yes, please do, you can definitely uh, get, grab the details, and I'm happy to chat more. So, where should we begin? Here we go. So my research agenda to date has focused on this problem of how do you train models to fulfill multiple criteria? So how do you train models to be efficient, reliable, robust, interpretable? And what are the trade-offs between these objectives? To kick off, I'll talk a little bit about how we got here, where we are, but also in this first talk, if you, I have, um, um, I have kind of two, two pieces to this talk. So one is this idea of what, where are we? What's the role of capacity? And also what motivates efficiency and work on efficiency? The second is the myth of the perfect model. So we'll talk a little bit about trade-offs and how hard it is to codify preferences in models. Um, and we'll see. By the time I'm done, I think the people in the back will be up here because they've been asked so many questions. <laughs> okay, so let's get going. Um, so we're currently in a very exciting time for research. This is a small research model that I test on my phone. I kind of like to test some of our models. And so I said, I'm giving a talk this afternoon about large language models. Can you give me five reasons why large language models are exciting? And the model responds. And this is very exciting because it's... Um, not the way that generative uh, models for language have been in the past. This is very fluid. This is coherent. This is um, what many humans would perceive to be um, high quality interaction. And you can even ask it, uh, so what are good places to visit around Bangkok? And then it will respond. And this is why people are excited about this moment in time, because this type of breakthrough was not really imaginable a while ago. But how do we get here? I think it's like, fun to understand how certain research ideas come to be and what takes place before them because it gives you a lot of insight into the, the fact that research is not really about a single idea, it's also about the environment in which ideas are allowed to take place. Um, and there's actually a long path to this moment. So I want to introduce you to Dr. Joseph Weizenbaum. Uh, he made a chatbot called Eliza. Who knows of Eliza? Who is aware? Excellent, nice, excellent. Okay, what is Eliza? Excellent. Excellent. So what the gentleman is saying, it was a chatbot designed to be a, a therapy interface. Um, and it's a classic chatbot, right? It's, you know, from the 1956, I believe. Yeah, but it's one of the earlier. What was, why, why bring up Eliza? What was interesting about Eliza? Why do we know of it now? Who, who wants to take a guess? Like, why do we still talk about it? Courage, come on, courage. Why do we talk about Eliza? Go ahead, yep. It was very persuasive at the time. So what you're saying is that it was a problem that had previously appeared to be unsolved. It's not clear that Eliza solved it, but it was very persuasive at the time. How did Eliza work? What was, you know, what was the difference between Eliza and modern chatbot technology? Yep, is that a pen back there? No, nope. adjusting the hair, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe it just use some simple rule-based uh, strategies instead of like generative stuff like today. Excellent. So what the gentleman is saying is that it used very simple rule-based strategies. In fact, it used rules based on a type of therapy called Rogerian therapy. So 
maybe I'll start the conversation like this. I'll say, hello, I'm your therapist for today. And you'll say, <laughs> excellent. And then I'll say, go on. And you'll say, oh, and excellent. And I'll say, and what makes you feel like that? And you'll say, and on and on and on. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm just mirroring back what you say without really uh, adding any context that requires understanding. And this was extremely, thank you, that was excellent. Very good demo, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and this is, uh, so Eliza was rule-based, so that was uh, the key difference. But what was striking about it was that you can kind of see why this runs into a cliff. So if I try that same conversation, I'm giving a research talk about large language models, can you give me five reasons why? Uh, Eliza will try and reply, is it that you would like to be able to give you five reasons large language models are exciting? So there's a clear cliff in performance. Eliza can't handle complex interactions. And the rules were things like, if you can't identify a keyword or phrase, Eliza uses a stock phrase, such as, please go on, or let's explore that more. So this is very simple, but what was striking about it is that many users of Eliza were convinced. In fact, Dr. Joseph ended up writing a very grumpy book because he found his uh, secretary at the time talking to Eliza about her boyfriend, and he said that this was uh, a part of a wider issue of us attaching or humanizing models. And so it's very interesting because we're in a similar moment now where there's a lot of discussion about humanizing or trying to attach properties to models. And so he wrote this fantastic grumpy book, which I, I, I think is timely. It's all about how these are statistical models and we have to be careful about really mo uh, humans uh, treating models as if they're uh, a human soundboard. Um, so, what separates Eliza from our current chatbots? What allows for research breakthroughs? Okay, in the back, I need three points. What separates, what has changed since 1964? And it has to come from the back rows. Excellent, Bracel, excellent. Yes, what is it? You can shout it out. Pardon? Compute, excellent, one point. Okay, what else? Data, yes, we have a lot more data. This is very true. So we have two things happening, which is we have a lot more compute. We'll talk about what that allowed, but that's a key component. We had a lot more data. We'll talk about maybe why that's important. What else? Deep learning. Deep learning. We have changes to the representation. So we have new representations and how you can extract uh, um, or learn. Yes, what else? Language, language, okay, tell me more. What do you mean by language pattern? Yeah. 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 So this is a very good point. What's being described is that Eliza was essentially rule-based. So we'll talk about the shift also in modeling philosophy. So part of it is this connection with a shift to deep neural networks where you delegate to the model the ability to extract a representation rather than codify what that representation should be. So we'll talk about that, so that's excellent. What else? Uh, excellent, in the back, yes. Uh, the available computational power. The available computational power, that relates, so the, the more compute, yep, I agree. What else? Pardon? The internet, ah, very related, right? So this question of data and how we also, uh, you know, have collected a lot of data over time, but the internet is what allowed that. We've moved away from traditional knowledge stores and also, that's also gonna impact the quality of data, which we'll talk about later. Okay, one more thing, who wants to venture? Anything else we should be thinking about before, go ahead. Size, yes, so this is gonna be very related to why we need compute, but size is gonna come up, but actually size is gonna come up in a grumpy way, so stay posted, yeah. So let's begin. So for most of computer science history, there's been these two fields of how to make progress, and I think what's striking is that computer science history is not that long, so we're still within the first generation of modern computer science history that really started after World War II. 
for most of this, actually, most people were in this camp, so rule-based expert systems. ELISA is an example of that. Rule-based systems were very effective at very narrow tests, and so you saw a lot of persuasive use as long as the search space was very small. But the difficulty was when you made it more complex. The other camp, so this idea of pattern recognition, extracting patterns, delegating to the model to extract patterns, was called the connectionist or deep neural network approach. And rule-based systems dominated. And this is an example of a use case where it was very persuasive, like checkers, small, small search space, so you can kind of codify in a very clear way what steps should be taken. Um, and what's interesting is that there's always a setting in which research takes place. So for a long time, researchers working on connectionist ideas were marginalized from the research community, treated like the Bayesians of today. So, <laughs> but just like one day the Bayesians will have the uprising, so too did the connectionists. And what's interesting is that um, it, when you think about what led to this, um, it was a combination of having adequate resources to pursue research ideas that were not immediately applicable but could be relevant. And so I think about this a lot because uh, during this time, only a few countries preserved funding for connectionist ideas, Canada being one of them. So when me and Ake were at Google Brain, almost all the directors were from Canada. It was basically, that was it. It was all the senior people from Canada. Why? Because that was one of the only countries that preserved funding during that time. And so when this was, uh, an impressive transition to actually be a successful idea, those were the researchers who were leading. I think about this a lot because we need to preserve research diversity and how we fund and how we allocate resources. And this for me is one of the prime examples. Um, so we know in hindsight that the breakthrough was 2012. So in 2012, we had this very successful AlexNet submission which reduced error rate by um, 15.3, uh, 10.8% percentage points lower than that of the runner up. And overnight, everyone shifts. So it's one of those moments where you have a market adoption because it was so impressive. Um, and I think, well, something I think about a lot is that I would argue this was in partly due to hardware. So we talked about compute. I think hardware is also a component in this. So during the early 2000s, a lot of slow, steady work was done to adapt GPUs to work with deep neural networks. And uh, it was actually the combination. The empirical success in 2012 was largely because of the ability to distribute compute over multiple co um, GPUs. And it allowed the acceleration of one of the key operations in, uh, in deep neural networks, matrix multiplies. So um, if you're interested in that, I have a paper on it, so feel, you know, uh, the hardware lottery, and I talk a lot about this interaction, why we should care about the tools, because I think, again, if you think about what, why certain research ideas can show themselves to be successful, often it's a combination of factors, but tooling is one. There's a lot of great ideas which are hard to do right now because of our tooling. I'll talk about some of them later. So overnight, 2012, everyone switched to deep neural networks. So what happened next? Um, 2017, the transformer, this is actually the culmination of many different steps in language processing, but there was one thing that transformers did very well. What was it? Like, what was the big breakthrough? Okay, go ahead. Parallel, all, all yes, ways. parallelizable, so it worked better to effectively use a compute. Yeah, what else? Uh, attention, attention mechanism is, uh, is, uh, is I, I think before this paper, you have some attention on the, on the, uh, something like the neural trans translation that can use this mechanism and, and grow, like, increase the, the performance. Yes, excellent. So what is being said here is crucial. So one, it was paralyzable. So this allows for more effective use of compute, but also effectively the use of uh, attention reduced one of the main limitations of previous approaches where LSTM, the difficulty was preserving context over long lens. So you would have uh, this, ability, this difficulty with uh, gradient saturation, which means that you would lose your longer context. So this was the breakthrough. 
So modeling longer text dependencies. And so overnight, everyone switched again. We had another pivotal, uh, pivotal switch. And um, transformers are basically the building blocks of all these large language models. And so it's interesting because a lot of what we're doing now is converging on single arch architecture. This also has risks. We can talk about that. You know, transformers are probably not the end point. I don't think anyone would say that. So it, it's risky if you overfit too much to a single type of architecture. But I call 2017 to 2023 the great acceleration. What happened during this time? Okay, excellent. Go ahead. Okay, Imogen, ChatGPT, okay. Maybe let's, because I think if we named models, we would run out of checklists. <laughs> but let's name concepts. So what happened? What are key concepts that changed? What led to ChatGPT, Imogen? Model Go ahead. Care. Okay, yes, so Transformers Architecture 1. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask Transformers. Yeah. But okay, that's taken. One more chance. <laughs> yeah, go um, ahead. Generative pre-training. Yes, so we'll talk about it. So unsupervised pre-training. We are going to talk about that. Excellent. That is actually a nice point on the checklist. Yes, go ahead. Okay, yes, we did have an advancement. We've had, um, we've had shifts in hardware, which have led to mainly more memory. I would say one of the interesting things is that they're largely still trying to uh, optimize the same operation, matrix multiplies, but they've gotten more effective about it. So if you look at the transition from like P100s to A100s to H100s, like a lot of what you're doing is seeing more available memory, which is, yeah, so that is part of it. We're, we're able to train, maybe it's getting a second point, so what else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, scale, scale, right? So we've had uh, this uh, unfortunate uh, trend of bigger is better. Why is it unfortunate? We'll talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, what else? At the back, I insist on the back. <laughs> go ahead, yes. researcher in this field. So that's why, I mean, we can create ah. more and more the, uh, the exciting uh, research. Yeah. Yes, so actually that's an important point. It doesn't, it rarely gets mentioned, is that when you have a breakthrough, you also have more available resources. And sometimes it means that researchers can, you know, th there's more freedom for researchers to explore because there's, it's very interesting, there's few points in history where you have a research idea at the frontier that's simultaneously a product. When that happens, it can go either way, but one positive benefit is that it often unlocks a lot of resources for researchers and tends to mean that you have a lot more people who are able to work in the field. So there's also trade-offs, which are interesting to talk about in the wider ecosystem, but this is a very nice point, yeah. What else? One more from the back. Go ahead, yeah. Uh, I wanted to go in the same direction, like the communities got created, like Hugging Face and stuff, where researchers could connect. Ah. And on the other hand, um, easy to use packages got curated like uh, PyTorch, SKLearn and stuff so everybody could start easily with machine learning. This is very interesting. I completely agree. There's been, um, it's not that these resources didn't exist in certain ways, but I do think we've had this shift towards having pre-trained models available and then doing things on top. And it's very interesting. It overcomes some of the need for compute and it has been pivotal for unlocking certain directions of research. And we'll talk about that. That's a very, very good point. Tooling also is often underestimated, but it's one of the most critical pieces for research adoption. I think that what sometimes researchers don't understand is that a releasing a good software package to uh, accompany your ideas is often a reason why the idea is adopted. So things like, you know, someone presented on Shapley values here. One of the reasons that's so popular is that it was released as a, a very easy to incorporate library very early on after it was introduced, as well as GradChem. GradChem is a method that I'm very grumpy about, but it was widely adopted because it's been made and incorporated into software packages early on. So people don't realize this, but it's actually very pivotal to adoption of ideas. Yeah, okay, perfect. We have some good starting points. So um, the first one is actually, I think the gentleman in the middle said, which is this idea of pre-training on larger and larger data sets in an unsupervised fashion. 
So uh, what do we mean by unsupervised here? Or if you are Jan LeCun, self-supervised. But what do we mean by this? What's the, how is it structured as a task? There's no wrong answer. It, there's actually multiple ways you can, go ahead. Okay, but how do we then make it into a task? If there's no labels, then how do we make it into a task for the unsupervised pre-training? Go, repeat, what was that point? Sorry? Clustering, okay, yes, you could do clustering. That's actually a common unsupervised technique. So why do we not maybe do clustering for pre-training? What's the limitation with clustering here? We could do it. What's the, what's the difficulty? It's quite computationally expensive to cluster just trillions and trillions of tokens across the internet. So it could be an avenue. Uh, it's a, you know, an interesting direction of work, but we don't really typically use it for unsupervised pre-training. But this is a great suggestion. What do we do? How do we normally structure this pre-training stage? Pardon? Yes. Excellent. So uh, what the gentleman said is, we train it to reconstruct the data. What does that mean? We train it to predict the next token. So we've kind of forced an acrobatics of a, of a task. We forced it into a supervised format. This is actually very common in computer vision for a long time. Computer vision do the predict the patch. There's a lot of different techniques. But in NLP for a long time, there was skepticism that you could do this in an informative way. And what was the big game changer for making it work? Sales supervised. Oh, sales supervised, yes. So there's the, te there's the technique. But people have been playing with this for a while. It didn't work. What was the big game changer for making it work? Math language model. Yes, you could say large language model. Yes, that's part of it. But I think even early experiments with transformers were not as successful. So what was the trick? Yes. Not quite, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Word embeddings, not quite. I mean, there were a lot of optimization changes, but the reason why unsupervised pre-training ended up working was something quite simple. Well, go ahead, yeah, you want. We had a lot of data. So two weeks ago, I met the Google engineer who started Common Crawl. He did it because he quit Google. And he did it when no one was talking about data. He did it actually because he was sad that he didn't have access to Google data. He worked in ads when he was at Google. He started one of the first ad teams at Google. And he's been shocked that suddenly his Common Crawl data set is interesting to everyone because he made it early 2000s. Like, and so no one used it, no one used it, and then it was used for this, and the combination of scale and the subjective is what unleashed it. So it's very interesting. It was because unsupervised pre-training typically is a weaker signal, so you need massive amounts of data to benefit from it. And why is pre-training important in this way? What do we gain from pre-training? Oh, wow, this just went nuts. Whoa, okay. Whoa. <laughs> so I think I'm going back, yeah, okay. Okay, there we go. No one saw anything. <laughs> okay, so one more. Why do we pre-train? In general, not just for language, but for computer vision. Someone in the back. Yes, go ahead. Uh, we want to talk about the model from scratch. So that's why we want to use yes. the pre-train from the lab. Excellent. Yeah, so you have a good prior. So it's almost like you learn a lot from general data, and then maybe it's more efficient. You're already in a good conditioning space for what you do with your fine tuning. So this is good. What else? You know, what do we gain from unsupervised pre training? Go ahead. Yes.
Yep, excellent. So what's being said here is a few concepts. This idea that you're conditioning your optimization space. So we have a very high dimensional problem and we're starting to get to uh, a better search space. Like we're conditioning our optimization so that when we do it for our target problem, it's already in the general area. It's not random initialization. So um, now I'm scared to press next, okay. <laughs> so, um, there's also been changes in optimization strategy. So this is actually a fundamental shift. So we moved from an era where we did fine tuning for one task at a time. So we would have a small model for something like, oh, predicting the, the topic of text. We'd have another model for predicting sentiment. We'd have a third model for predicting something else. And you would train dedicated models, or you might fine tune, but it would be small, small models. And the big switch is that we've moved, right? One of the big changes in optimization strategy is that um, instead of ending up with independent models for each downstream task and fine tuning on your dedicated data, there's been a change to multitask fine tuning. So you train on multiple tasks at once. And how do you do this? You structure it as questions. So you could have very different data, but because you're structuring it all as a common task of asking questions and answers, you're able to train at the same time the entire model. This is actually more fundamental and uh, critical than we often think about, because what does it mean? It means that we transition from having custom models for every task to having a single general model that can perform a lot of tasks, which we often only require zero or a few shot examples. So this is a big deal. It's a change in how we model. And what it means if we have a single model that can perform a lot of tasks, we focus a lot of resources in that single model because now we're asking for it to be a general purpose model. This is gonna become critical for evaluation later. It's very hard now to evaluate models because we expect it to do everything because we've shipped paradigms from single purpose models to general purpose models. But the part that allowed us to do this was the role of data. So for a long time, I don't think many of my colleagues cared about data. <laughs> I think a lot of people focused, kind of abstracted away data and said, well, we have this representation that will learn or extract what's important from data, so we don't have to care about data. Now everyone cares about data again. And it's very interesting, and why? because there's been renewed interest in the types of data that lead to this zero-shot ability. So what's zero-shot ability? Someone in the back, who hasn't spoken? You see the back is, you know, you chose the back. I didn't choose it, but yeah. So we need uh, someone who has not spoken in the back. What's zero-shot ability? This is an easy one. Go, go ahead. It, it just answers. Uh, you don't need to train the model. You, it just receives the input and answer that question. Yes, it's this idea that you don't have to have an example of this in your pre-training data. You can test on an unseen task. Frankly, it's a strenuous concept. What could be one reason why you would be skeptical about zero-shot uh, performance if you were to be a skeptical scientist? You, okay, go on. What do you mean by that? Well, you do, you know the zero shot, you know what the task is, it just hasn't been seen by the model, you know, go ahead. Pardon? It does break, yes, the premise of it is that it's breaking this assumption that you have not seen this within your distribution sampled in the wild, but it's seen only at your zero shot performance time. This is an example of what I would call a zero shot maybe example. Tell me a story about a wizard fish who goes to boarding school underwater. Like that's a combination of concepts that maybe is unusual. And the model says there once was a wizard fish named Phineas who was very excited to start his first year at boarding school. So this is an example of maybe concepts coming together. Why zero shot is interesting is that the idea of an unseen example is typically talked about with reference to your fine tuning data, not with your pre-training data. And there's increasing evidence that because we don't know, because we're training on so much pre-training data, it's actually very hard at this point to say what is zero shot with 100% confidence because it's just hard. We can't guarantee that the model has not seen some combination. But still, I think what excites people about this concept is the interpolation between concepts that is very capable in these models. So, it, you know, it, I, 
even though this is kind of an odd example, even if it was seen in some other format in the pre-training data, it is persuasive how the model can interpolate in interesting ways and combine these concepts together. And that's what impresses people about zero shot. Um, but people often talk about zero shot in terms of multilingual or translation. But why that's a little bit more strenuous is that we don't really know what's in the pre-training data. The pre-training is scraped off the internet. We have some filters for multilingual, but some multilingual creeps in. So it's very possible the model saw some variation of this. Yeah. Did you want to say something else? Okay, just nodding, nice, okay. Um, so it turns out two ingredients have been very important for this breakthrough with data. So one, structuring multitask fine tuning data is question and answers. Um, and what do we mean by that? So you might have uh, the prompt, what we refer to as like the prompt, and that's typically structured as a question, and then the completion. So you have some type of completion. And um, this it has led to a lot of gains in uh, fine-tuning performance. And this combination of training on many tasks and training on instruction-style data has really dramatically improved zero-shot performance. Um, and so what that means is, is that if you look at this, so these are clusters used for instruction tuning. As you increase the amount of clusters you train on together, you improve the performance on these held-out tasks. Um, and it's particularly helpful in limited regimes. Why? Someone from the back. Why is this helpful in data limited regimes? What are we gaining? Should I walk over? <laughs> what do we gain? Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Yep. Pardon? Oh, yeah, you can uh, shout it out. Yeah. yeah, because we can generalize. So we don't need any data to yes, train a model yeah. because the model can generalize and therefore also Exactly. Make predictions. This is a nice, easy one because, you know, with data limited, this is where we most need zero shot, right? Because we don't have much data. Um, and so um, data limited regimes struggle to realize the gains of fine tuning. The alternative to zero shot prompting or few shot prompting is traditional fine tuning, right? But it's data limited regimes that are most struggle to fine tune, especially the larger the amount of weights that you have. The bigger your model, the more data you need for fine tuning effectively. Um, and fine tuning large language models can be expensive. So it's data limited regimes that really benefit. Um, but this is the interesting part and it kind of starts this transition to the next stage, which is that you also acquire larger and larger models to take advantage of st instruction fine tuning. So this is what has propelled a lot of, you know, going back earlier to those trends that we thought we would talk about, size, model size. We've just seen this growth because it seems that to capitalize on instruction tuning, you need much more parameters than is typical. So, um, the other part that's been critical is collecting human preferences. So often this is referred to as reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, I think it's debatable whether the reinforcement part, re learning part is um, necessary. I think there's a lot of emerging areas in this area of optimization. People are going to try a lot of different things. But the commonality is that we're incorporating human preferences about what types and styles of data responses are needed. I would also say this is a response to our lack of ability to use our traditional benchmarks because now we have a general purpose model. How do we test a general purpose model using the very narrow benchmarks we have previously created for single purpose models? Our solution has been to try and bridge this evaluation gap with human feedback, but also what's interesting about this is also to incorporate in the optimization process. And this is new and this is very important. So, by the way, we'll, uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, okay, nice, okay, and then we'll take a break. Um, this is good, yeah, we're doing well. Okay, so this requires a much smaller sample of annotations, which is then used to align for a more uh, opt aligned objective. So, in summary, this has been a roller coaster. We've seen changes in optimization, but also breakthroughs on tasks. And so now, um, I'm gonna use the rest of this tutorial to talk about some open challenges that I think about a lot. I think this is a nice setting for us to start. So in this first session, I'm gonna talk about efficiency, and then in the next session, I'm gonna talk about some open challenges with just this myth of how we build models that we think are good. 
Um, so let's get started. I think with efficiency, um, and we have a nice amount of time, so uh, more time for me to pick on the back. You're welcome to reassign your seating after the break. So, <laughs> um, so the renewed urgency for efficiency. So we're in this bigger is better regime of number parameters. Why? We've talked about it a bit, but why? Why are we stuck in this uh, race for more and more parameters? Hardware, so maybe uh, hardware is a side effect. We need more and more hardware because we need bigger and bigger models. But why do we want bigger and bigger models? Yeah, so there's something about, there is this relationship between data set size and model size. It's actually becoming more and more complex, that relationship, I would say. Traditionally, we thought you have to go much bigger if you use more data, but now there's this interesting tension where it's clear you can get away with less model size if you train for longer. We'll talk about that a bit. Um, but yeah, why else? Why do, we, why do we care so much about bigger is better? Pardon? Yes, it's a tough, it's a difficult thing to be grumpy about because it works. So we have a tough job to do to find something better. And we're seeing this bigger is better in both vision and NLP. And what we, what is very difficult to argue against is that there's papers like this, which say, oh, different regimes of scale induce different emergent abilities. But also there's what you know, you feel when you're interacting with large language models. There seems to be a shift in performance. So we currently have this formula, which is effective, which is a, the worst thing, you know. I think that it's hard to, to carve out an alternative path if, if the simple path is working so well. So, um, but nonetheless, I will try and argue that we need a better way. <laughs> um, so I would say that the key limitation of this approach is that our understanding of this relationship between weights and generalization properties is far from well understood. So we like it because it's simple and it fits into maybe a quarterly cadence so you can just throw and run your model and have a bigger model, but we don't really understand what is happening. And why do we need such so many weights in the first place? So one, I would say there's diminishing returns to adding more weights. So this is an old school example. So it's comparing inception v3 versus inception v4, but we see this in many domains. It's this idea that you can double the number of parameters from 21 to 41, but you only have two percentage gains in accuracy. So we do see that as you add more and more parameters, you see more marginal gains. You also have redundancies between weights. So this is a really nice paper. It finds that you can use a tiny holdout of weights. Um, I think it's, yeah, you can use a small set of weights to predict 95% of weights in the network. What does that mean? It means that these are very correlated weights, you know, so there's redundancy between them. There's also this intriguing relationship between weights and data. So this just came up, but there's papers like Chinchilla, which show that you can get away with a much smaller model if you train on more data for longer. So there's axes of capacity that are not just about weights, it's also about how you use those weights. There's actually more work recently which shows that you can um, get away with a smaller model if you care more about data quality. So we'll talk about that in a bit, but there's this very interesting direction of research around data pruning. How do you remove weight of data which is not important? And most weights can be removed without uh, drops in performance after training is done. So why they appear critical for training, afterwards we can remove um, really 90% of all weights, or 91. So this is very fun because this is actually a paper that we did on comparing different techniques. This is random pruning. So you can just randomly remove most of your weights and see very marginal drops in performance. And what that is saying is, why do we need these weights if we can get rid of them afterwards? What is so important about the initial optimization stage that we need all these weights? So, and we also find that what you do when you remove these weights, and I'll introduce this work a bit later, is that what you're really uh, doing when you remove the weights is you're losing performance on rare artifacts. So think about that. What that's really saying is that the majority of weights are used to learn a representation for the rare parts of our distribution, the long tail. But how inefficient is that, that we're paying so much to learn the long tail? This is not a sustainable path. It's like building a ladder to the moon. 
And so this is something we'll talk about a lot. What, what representations do we need to, to learn these rare artifacts? It's very related to memorization. So this is a motivation for work on efficiency. I think there's two motivations. There's the practical motivations. One of the reasons I first started getting interested in efficiency is that I grew up in very resource-constrained environments. I grew up mainly in Africa, different parts of Africa, and there a large constraint is access. How do you make technology accessible? And we'll talk a little bit about how those practical uh, motivations can coincide with these theoretical. But there's also very nice theoretical questions which drive interest in efficiency. So how does generalization properties change as models get bigger and bigger? But also, why do we need so many parameters to begin with? And if we have this incredibly inefficient representation, where do we go next? We, you know, a short-term or medium-term difficulty with arguing against large weights is we're still seeing gains. But in the longer term, this is a very painful way to pay for gains. We're just adding a lot of parameters. So a point of comparison is that our brain is incredibly efficient. So we have specialized pathways. It's much easier for you to walk and talk than it is for you to walk and read, for example. I don't know if you've ever tried walking and reading, but it's very disorientating. Um, we also have log scale vision, which means it takes a noticeable change for us to register, but we don't really pay attention to small, small changes. That's one of the reasons one of the areas computer vision has been most effective is on medical images, because as humans, we're not actually well suited to medical images. It takes us, th there's often finite differences that are very hard for us to pick up on because we have log scale vision. Uh, but log scale vision, it saves us a lot of energy, why? Someone in the middle, this middle section. Yes, why, why does log scale vision efficient? Yes, excellent, precisely. You're imp you're, you're, you can't pick up on small changes, and so you, the, the brain doesn't have to process it. You essentially have a filter, and so it's very nice for our efficiency. Um, and we simulate much of what we see. So for example, unless I do something crazy like this or like that, you're probably simulating me, like you're, you're, you don't do a full processing. You're just comparing it to the previous frame. And this is very efficient, right? Because it means we're not doing a full forward, backward pass for everything, all, everything in our surroundings. Um, I think some aspects of what we do with deep neural networks is painfully inefficient, right? So we don't have adaptive compute. There's some people here who are working on adaptive compute, but I would say this is a nascent area. And mo most of what we mean by adaptive compute is typically um, adaptive models, like changing where you route but it's not changing the amount of times that a model sees something during optimization. So there's, there's this question of why do we have to show all our examples uh, to the model mul multiple times? Like why do we show the same examples the same amount of times? Humans don't do that. Typically what we do is we'll squint when we see something challenging. We'll like double up, we'll get more information and improve our certainty, but we won't do that for easy examples. Like we won't you know, see everything the same amount of times. But also global updates means that all prior information is easily erased. We'll talk about this. This was talked about yesterday as catastrophic forgetting. This is a big issue. It means it's very inefficient. This whole idea of how we update to reflect the world, it will come out there. And empirical risk minimization means that we optimize for average performance. So it takes so much effort and compute to get that last, you know, the underrepresented, the, la the, the rare features. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, and this is why I find efficiency super interesting. Okay, so a lot of my own research is focused on efficiency, so I'll share some quick observations, and then let's do questions, and then we'll break. Um, so I just wanna share just an overview of common directions if you're interested or wanna learn more. So there's a few key directions in compression techniques, so quantization, model distillation, architecture design, uh, where you train a model to be efficient from scratch. Um, quantization, we'll talk about. Um, I'll let people take a picture. Yes, please do take a picture. <laughs> um, so pause for the picture. Um, and uh, quantization is interesting. So quantization, 
uh, there's different types, right? There's you quantize during training, during fine tuning, mixed quantization, um, adaptive quantization. But you can think about it as uh, really there's different costs. So there's the cost of going to the grocery store, and so this is data movement. There's a cost of storing your groceries. This is what we call CPU, GPU memory. And then there's a cost of cooking. So this is actually your compute, what you're doing in the kitchen. This is actually an interesting part about efficiency because typically uh, what quantization is doing is trying to reduce the amount of things that you have to store. So you just buy less at the grocery store, you have to store less, and you have to cook with less while preserving performance. Pruning also tries to do this, but it has some complications with interaction with hardware. But these are the key things that we want to minimize. And we'll talk a little bit about how training and inference are different. Um, so um, we want to reduce, and quantization is very effective at this. So if you go from float 32 to float 16, you're having your memory, so because you're just storing less. Um, there's interesting work, which I'll share briefly, which one of the scholars just finished, where um, quantizing at scale has been considered very difficult. Why? Because after a certain amount of scale, say 6 billion, the model becomes very sensitive to quantization. So it's not possible to cut your groceries without hurting performance. Why is this interesting? People have referred to it as an emergent property, so something that emerges that we don't know how it emerges at scale. And uh, multiple papers have reported this extreme sensitivity to quantization. I actually took it as a wider question, and Arash, who led this work, I'm very, I think this is such nice work because it's taking a wider view of are these properties inherent to scale, or are they also because of the nurture of the model? Is it also because of the optimization strategies we use? So in this um, paper, we actually looked at um, how do we uh, look at changes in optimization strategy that would prevent the sensitivity. So looking at is it a solely a factor of scale alone, or does it matter how we train? This is actually a wider question I think is important because we often talk about emergent properties as if they appear magically, but I think it's because we just don't have a good understanding of optimization at certain scales. And I think this is an important step in understanding what leads to certain properties. So what we find is that you can actually avoid these cliffs if you do certain pre-training measures, including whether you use things like B float versus float. These are different types of um, bit representation, and they have significant effects on gradient flow. And so this is really interesting work. So I thought I would mention that briefly. Um, and I'll share slides afterwards. There'll be a link so you can take a look. So um, this opens up new directions for more efficient quantization, but it also poses this interesting question of what other emergent properties um, are actually not just a, because of emergence due to scale, but are due to how we optimize. So. Um, we also have archite architecture optimization, so building a more efficient architecture from scratch. I want to reference a few that are very active right now as research areas. One is retrieval databases. So you have a parametric model, which is your um, updated model that's learnable, and then you have a non-parametric model, which means it's just a database, and you have some notion of distance where you, where you uh, reference and find similar instances within your database. It turns out that's very effective for uh, particularly problems like keeping your model up to date. It can be cheaper to keep adding to a database than it can be to keep training your base model. So retrieve augmented databases are going to be a very important research direction over the next few years. Um, we actually just finished a very nice work which shows that you can also mitigate toxicity in a continual learning way using retrieval databases because it can be much more efficient to add in examples of toxicity over time. And that was led by Louisa, so that's under submission, but I'll try and include a link when I send this out. Then we have adapters. So these are, what are adapters, actually? Someone from the middle, from this side of the middle. Yeah, what are adapters? Or this side of the middle. <laughs> Yeah. Or add to the weight of the model. So, so when you put in an adapter, it goes to modify certain areas or certain weights of the model. Excellent. So the gentleman is completely right. So it's an addition to the architecture. That sounds odd, right? If we're adding weights, how is it efficient? Yeah, so just to be clear, to fully describe it, adapter, you add weights, so you typically add additional weights, and then you update those weights. But how does that add to efficiency? Yeah, it's odd. We're adding more weights, right? So what makes it efficient? From the back, anyone? 
I see someone pondering. I see they're like thinking, they've got their hand on their chin, they look like they want to say something. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one up here and then we'll go to the back. Yes. You're not updating the rest of the model, so yes, you have fewer parameter updates, so that does save some time, but that's not actually the main benefit, which is kind of interesting. Uh, why, why is it more efficient? Why does adding more weights more efficient? Uh, I was gonna say the same thing. You only have to update those weights, so like with Laura, you only have to update like a percentage of the weights. Oh, who's speaking? I can't see. Oh, excellent. Oh, nice. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so Laura is a great example of adapter. So what this actually means, so why it translates to efficiency even though you're adding more weights, is that because you don't have to update all the weights of the model, you don't have to store multiple vision, versions of the big model. So yes, the updates are cheaper because it's fewer parameters, but it's also the storage savings. So it means that, let's say you're deploying models at scale and you have many different use cases for your model. You can, you can store these tiny little adapters and then reference them, pull them from memory when they're needed. You don't have to store massive 52 billion parameter models, one for each use case, which is really the cost of fine tuning. It's not necessarily the cost of the updates themselves. That is more expensive in the moment you're doing it, but it's the cost of storage as well, which is like, this is a big critical saving of uh, these adapters. Um, but even small scale developers really like them because it's also good for GPU memory. It means that you also, um, often it's just easier, the fine tuning cost is not as bad at scale when you're already, everything's pretty costly. But for, uh, if you have a single GPU, it's nice to just be able to update a few weights. So there's two benefits. The short-term benefit of updating a few weights, the long-term benefit of just not needing as much memory to store many different tasks. Okay, so um, pruning in the data space. I would say this is a very important area. Our lab is really working on multiple directions around this, but how do you estimate quality at scale? If you have something that is, the internet, so much of it is rubbish. How do we tell what's rubbish? Right now, we do this very heuristically, right? We do manual filters. It's kind of like an expert system. <laughs> like we have all these manual filters like, oh, if there's less than three Reddit replies, cut that data. We only want Reddit replies. But who comes up with this stuff? It's this funny. So I think this is one of the things I'm most interested in is like how do we actually create uh, more systematic views of what is quality? It's very related to this question of uncertainty that was brought up earlier because there's many different things of what constitutes quality. Like you can think of it as subset selection, you can think of it, of it as uh, uncertainty reduction. You'll end up with different things depending on how you view this question of data selection because it's a data selection question. Um, so this is, I'm happy to chat about this. We have a few ongoing. And then sparsity, a lot of my work has been on sparsity. So data pruning would be data sparsity. It's essentially setting to zero that data point. So you're removing one data point at a time. Activation sparsity, weight sparsity. So uh, I wanna talk about one thing with sparse neural networks that I think is interesting. Remember when we said, oh, it's very curious that you can remove all these weights after training, but you can't start with minimal weights. For me, this is one of the most interesting questions about sparsity because most work has focused on dense to sparse. What that means is you take a dense model and you're trying to minimize the number of weights, so you sparsify after training. This is valuable work. It teaches us a lot about what weights do, but for me, this is not the most interesting part of sparsity. I think the second question of sparse to sparse, can we train starting sparse and can we adapt the network as we learn more? It's very related to this idea of adaptive computation, but it's also fundamentally quite powerful because if we can start sparse, that means that we've captured what is really inefficient about the current space, which is it appears we need to throw all these weights at the problem to learn a good conditioning space. It would, it's quite, um, uh, it's almost like a core question of can you find a good conditioning space starting sparse and adapting as you go to the data? Very interesting, much more challenging. Much more work is focused here than here. So, um, and dense to sparse typically does three separate stages. So you train a large overparameterized network. You typically gradually introduce sparsity because you don't want to do it one shot because it's too extreme. You'll see a performance dive. And then you continue to train, so you recoup that sparsity, or you recoup that performance. So you have almost two problems, I would say, that are core to this. One is an estimation problem. 
So accurately estimating what weights are important to remove. The other is a calibration problem. So calibration problem, we actually always trust the model to do it for us. We don't trust ourselves to recalibrate the weights. So typically our solution is just to fine tune, but if you think about the core of this problem, it's to recalibrate the importance. So given the removal, how do you recalibrate the instances? Yeah. Um, is there a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's okay if you have a question. I love how you're like, no. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm gonna end on this, and then how many minutes do we have? Three minutes? 30. Ah, nice, then we can do questions, and then we can stretch and take a break. Okay, divide between theoretical and applied motivation. So I said that there's many reasons that people come to the subfield, which makes it actually a very interesting subfield for reviews, because <laughs> people come for almost two different reasons. Some are very driven by these elegant theoretical questions, some are very driven by these real world impacts. I wanna highlight some areas where there's a tension between the two, because I think this is fun to think about. So where is that tension between the two? So often in the theoretical lens, we treat inference and training at the same time, but in an applied lens, this matters a lot, the difference between these regimes, why? In training, the cost of the backward pass is enormous. So you have this forward pass, and then you have the backward pass. Typically, to compute the backward pass, what do you need? Oh, so yes, you, how do you compute the gradients? What do you need to compute the gradients in your backward pass? Yes, you can use backpropagation. Well, what's the core, you know, if we think about backpropagation, what do you need to st have on hand? Pardon? Pardon? You need memory? Why do you need memory? What do you need to access? Yes, so the gradients after the layers, what does that mean? What do you need to access? Your activations. So as you go forward, you're accumulating activations every step. In larger and larger models, these activations are bigger and bigger because you have deeper models typically. And, you have, um, and what that means is to compute your backward pass, you still need to reference those activations to do your back propagation. How you store those activations and how long you store them for is critical. So this is all about memory management. Um, and also here, data and model parallelization can make a big difference because you have such a heavy memory constraint because of the need to do both. Whereas what changes at inference time, you just have to compute the activations and you can discard them immediately. You don't have to store them for the back propagation step. Okay, so your key constraint is ma managing device memory and distribution. What about for inference? When we do inference, what changes? What's the biggest constraint? Who wants to guess? When we're deploying a model, what actually, what changes? What, what, what is the, one of the key constraints? So go ahead. Pardon? Yes, so what does that mean? Yeah. Real-time predictions, what does that mean? What do we care about? Speed, oh, I love how it came from everyone at once. That was a nice moment. Yes, we need speed. This is critical. Because if you're deploying, people don't want to wait a lot. So here, partitioning of variables across devices becomes important. How you, if you're in a multi-device setup, which you are for these large language models, how you store things across devices become important, but also batch management. Because let's say you're actually in a deployment setting, you have customers coming at different rates, and in training, you know your batch, right? You know your data set, so you, you have a certainty so you can just pack a batch. When you're in a deployment setting, when do you stop and run inference? If you do it one batch size, batch size of one, it's very computationally expensive. So typically you want to batch request. But managing that, when you press go, versus how many requests you wait to load, it's actually a very difficult skill and it impacts latency a lot. Okay, so what we care about during inference, our key objective is latency, minimize, throughput, increase. We want to do more examples per um, second or tokens per second. Okay, so here's other tensions. So I told you I really like sparsity. You'll see many of the works I'll reference later talk about sparsity. Sparsity is very elegant from a theoretical perspective because it achieves the highest rates of compression and it also has this very nice uh, axis of exploration. But uh, 
it doesn't work on current hard hardware. Why? Because all of our hardware is bu being built around this idea of structured matrices. The same reason is why adaptive networks are very hard to work on current hardware, because this idea of slowly growing your network doesn't work if you're the model, if the hardware just expects a matrix each time. There's some hardware design that has been worked on this, like two by four block sparsity, one by four, but this is very fixed sparsity patterns. And then flops. Um, so flops are often preferred as a metric, but flops are actually sometimes deceiving. Like you can minimize flops and still end up with uh, more memory accesses. So minimizing flops doesn't necessarily tr translate to improvements all the time, but it's an imperfect measure. Um, also, there's some tensions between very nice ideas, like early exiting strategies and the tooling. So for example, with TensorFlow, even if you do an early exiting strategy, you don't actually gain anything because it's a graph-based uh, software, so it initializes the full graph no matter what, so you can't actually, you're still not gaining in memory. So there's these tensions with just the software. So I think I'm actually going to skip these. So let's stop there for efficiency. So we have one more block talk, right? So does the half hour include the break? For this session. Okay, great. Okay, so let's do questions. I think this is good. What is on your mind? Okay, excellent. Way at the back. I love this. Yeah, please go for it. Thank you. Um, so for the sparse to sparse, I'm very curious about this actually, and I was wondering what's the main way you're tackling this problem right now? It's the main approach that people are using. Yeah, so the main approach that people are using, there's a few different approaches. So there's things like SNP, which try and estimate what weights are important to grow, and so they'll look at the strength of the connections between weights and try to adaptively change that. There's also UKU, FC has worked on some algorithms which are also trying to improve further upon SNP. But typically, you take your estimation problem of what's important, and you're doing that in uh, a time step way instead of a single shot. So what, what happens when you look at the traditional framing of the problem, if I go back, um, so typically in the problem of starting with an over-parameterized network, you slowly, gradually remove the subset of weight. So you do calibration maybe every 500 steps. On, on, so it, this will depend on data set, but that's, you don't do it every step. With the growing the sparsity uh, network, the challenge is you have to do it more frequently because it's, it's higher risk, w what you decide to grow, how quickly you decide to grow. So typically the challenge is there's more variables. Already these questions of when do you prune, how much do you prune, what the interval of pruning, even for this setting, I would say is a little hacky the way we do it. We just learn best practices for certain data sets, or like we try and use reasonable. For this second problem of sparse to sparse, you have even more traces, because you're essentially changing your network at every step, and there's more ways it could go wrong with gradient flow. Yeah, that's a very good question though. Yeah, so I would look up SNP, and I would look up Uku FC's work, uh, and he also has excellent work on just looking at gradient flow. Part of, uh, so I don't know if I mentioned Caleb's work, who's one of my students, who has an excellent paper. We looked at gradient flow. Our question was, is it just about the weights, or there's some optimization choices that are biased towards dense networks? Because if you think about it, we've been designing optimization around dense networks for 20 years. We only are just starting to think about what makes sense for, for sparse networks. And we actually find there's a lot of choices that are biased towards dense networks. Like certain activation functions work way better for sparse networks. You need much better layer normalization so you can recalibrate your layers to take account of the fewer weights. So these are all things that are actually not even about the weights, but about the optimization practices that work with the weights. So it's very good. Yeah, so that was a great question. What else? Go ahead. Yep. Uh, so I saw you talking about the sparse models, but I've heard of another family, maybe, of a sparse model called the switch transformers. 
is that a different way of doing sparsity or, uh, or can you explain more about that? Yeah, so this is very good. You can think of it as sparsity. So switch transformer is in general a mixture of expert models. You can think of it as the sparsity is introduced at the model level, not at the weight level. So you might just have different components which are used different amount of times, but you preserve the same amount of flops despite having a lot more compute being used. So it's very interesting. Uh, typically, the problems there are uh, also optimization challenges. Uh, so with mixed trainer experts in general, very sensitive to training choices. The biggest difficulty tends to be balancing. So during the training itself, uh, who here has worked with a mixture of experts? Okay, well, good luck if you do. So no one has ventured, but I think this is one of the trickiest things for people who have worked on it. We just actually worked on mixture of experts this year for um, adapter style mixture of experts. Like, can you combine weight constraints with mixture of experts? It tends to be very sensitive to optimization choices. So when I talk about load balancing, what is the problem there? The problem there is that often when you have multiple different modular networks, it might default to one initially, and then that network becomes strong and always dominates. So tokens always get routed to the same expert. So you need some way to force diversity in your experts. The way it's done is quite hacky. There's many different strategies, but often people just say random routing at first, or they'll have some interval in which they do random, and then they'll switch to more precise. So there's a lot that we need to learn about optimization for this. But yes, you can think of this as sparsity at the model level. So very, very good question. Yeah, what else? Yeah, so I guess there's two questions there. One is, okay, so if we prune by setting the weights to zero, why do we have to retrain um, or recalibrate? So there's actually two possible strategies. One is that you recalibrate all weights. So that allows weights to come back from the dead, <laughs> so to speak. So let's say you're pruning iteratively over your training. You can either still allow gradient updates to all weights, and if something, uh, if a weight comes back in magnitude or importance, then it's revived from the dead and you have a mass that cuts off other weights. But it's also common that once a weight is dead, so to speak, you just set it to zero for the rest of the training and you're slowly introducing more sparsity while updating the remainder of the weights. So why do we update the remainder of the weights? Um, to, uh, empirically, one-shot pruning, which is if you didn't update the remainder of the weights, it's um, it, it, it's not as successful. It, there's quite a performance uh, disparity. You can think about why, like uh, maybe think about the simplest setting in which you have a matrix and you're setting some parts of your matrix to, to zero. Like you need to recalibrate the matrix for it to still have the same properties of the original matrix. So you can get around setting some elements to zero, but you need to recalibrate the rest for the transformation to be the same. Um, and so we just don't have a good way of doing this uh, mathematically at scale because of how many weights we have. So we use fine tuning. We use a model signal to do it for us. Yeah. Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yes. So those are done. Those are not one shot pruning. Those are recalibrated. So if it was one shot pruning, uh, I think what you're talking about is this work we did. Oh, did I skip it? Ah, uh, yes, it was part of the questions. Yeah, yeah, so this one, yeah. So if we had done one shot, it would be much lower. So we, you see typically more degradation if you don't allow recalibration. But for inference, we don't really care if we recalibrate or not because we assume it's okay to have more costs during training because we just want to store an efficient model for inference. So typically people will allow for recalibration, yeah. Although at scale, it poses a new problem. Like, let's say someone doesn't have access to the training setup. How do they sparsify it? That's the challenge. Yeah. What else? OK. And then, yeah. Yes. Uh, previously, you mentioned there's a multiple way to approach the, uh, to approach to address the efficiency issues, right? Uh, and you present uh, around three, which is uh, 
quantization and uh, quantization distillation and uh, so on, right? Uh, I wonder um, how much progress from each approach uh, that we ha uh, uh, that we can use to address uh, you. Uh, all these three, it seems that from your presentation, all these three works, but which one work better and which, uh, and how much wise, how much adoption mm. uh, that we uh, use from each techniques. Yeah. yeah, this is a very good question. Yeah. So, uh, follow up on oh, the, okay, good. Sneak in another. Yes, yeah. I like this. <laughs> because uh, this is just my, a little bit of my opinion, but I, uh, I used to hear a lot about distillation, but it uh, tend to die down a little bit. Uh, uh, faded away from the research community, at least in my area. Yeah. Uh, so I wonder that is whether the idea is still around or some people would uh, still work on this. Yeah. Okay. This is a good question. So, what has? What I guess the question is one. Like, how would you rate the real world impact of these techniques? So quantization is incredibly popular. Why? Because you have the memory if you do it right. The tricky part has been at scale, the sensitivity, but a lot of focus has been on quantization techniques. It also means that there's less ceiling there to grow. People have pretty much optimized quantization quite a bit. There's now new problems at scale, which is, I think, why I'm proud of the work that we were showing, where you show that there's all these conditioning effects that you can do to allow for quantization at scale. But this is very popular recipe because you just get a lot of bang for your buck. Like you do one change and then you get half your memory or more. It's also why people are trying to push the frontier even more. So now you hear about in four quantization, so not just in eight, but in four without performance degradation, this gets more and more tricky to preserve performance. But if you can do it, you're gaining a ton of memory. Model distillation, uh, it doesn't work well at scale. So there's a tipping point where we still haven't unlocked the ability to distill successfully. So for example, you won't have heard of language models at scale being distilled, mainly because people are not publishing the negative results, which is it's still quite tricky. Um, I would say there's an aspect of model distillation which is being rapidly explored right now, which is kind of a flip on the head of what model distillation is, is can you sample data from a larger generative model and use it to effectively train a smaller one? This is a different type of distillation, but it's quite interesting if you think about it. This has come up most controversially with alpaca, right? Because alpaca literally took, took Llama, sampled chat GPT, in a way that probably was not quite aligned with the terms of service, but effectively showed that if you sample ChatGPT, you could take a smaller model and mimic it in some way. It's not complete, but it's very interesting, right? It's a different type of distillation. You're sampling the outputs of a generative model to try and train a smaller model. It's very interesting as an approach. Yeah, and then I would say architecture design, very adopted. This idea of LoRa, this idea of adaptive, it's very popular. There's a lot of work on it. It's going to be very interesting. Sparsity. Uh, no, because sparsity doesn't play well with hardware. So people who work on sparsity, typically, they do it with the belief that hardware will catch up. And that often, as researchers, we need to work on frontier ideas and push hardware to catch up. Because sparsity is very effective. It's one of the most powerful compression techniques if we get it right. And you can unlock these adaptive designs. But right now, why is it not efficient in practice? Who can say? Like, why doesn't it work with hardware? Because, you know, so we kind of hinted at this, right? We set to zero what we remove. What does that mean? Yes, excellent. So we gain nothing because we're literally storing a zero. So this is really bad, right? So if you do certain types of sparsity, like fixed patterns, you can get gains because you can uh, do very clever matrix manipulations, but it has to be fixed. If you do unfixed sparsity, which is a true dream because you want to be truly sparse and adaptive, you don't realize any gains right now. So this is a good question. Okay, maybe one more question, then let's stretch and break and come back. Yes. Um, can you talk more about how people try to approach these questions about making neural network more sparse and more data efficient from a theoretical perspective? Oh, are you okay? <laughs> okay. Yes, I'm asking that because it seems that we don't understand the properties of these networks very well. So any theory that we form on that are based on untestable assumptions. So how do, so how do we go from there? Yeah, I would say it's a mix. There is important theory work, but often 
it doesn't translate to uh, the size of models that we have. So for example, uh, there's really nice work showing the optimal size of a model for certain types of data, but typically that type of work takes place when you know the ground truth of your data, so you're using synthetic data, and then you're using some information theoretic approaches of models. The, this is the divide that is not specific to efficiency, it's throughout the field as a whole. There's a tension between the dimensionality at which we're doing empirical research and the dimensionality in which you can control your variables to show theoretic formulations and proofs. So, I think there is important work, but some of it, you're correct in your assessment that some of it right now, with, for example, pruning, the interval at which you prune, how much you prune, those are typically empirically driven experiments that are fined um, at what works, but not necessarily because it's logical. I think a great example of why theory is struggling is this chart. Why is random working so well? This is variational dropout, so very complex Bayesian method, beautiful, very elegant. This is magnitude pruning, painfully simple. Who knows what magnitude pruning is? Yes, excellent. So what's being said is you just prune based on the absolute value of the weight. This is terrible, right? This is like a rule-based method. It's so bad. It works really well. Variational dropout is better at very high degrees of sparsity. So that's where the elegance starts to show. So you have variational dropout at 99%. Variational dropout outcompetes all the methods. But the cost for variational dropout is extreme. And then you see random and magnitude. And magnitude is pretty much on par for most of the regimes of sparsity that you would care about. So this is the difficulty we have. Why are we not doing dramatically better than random printing? Why is random printing so good? Like, this is bad. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So we read it through your first uh, talk as well. It seems to be fair to tell long this point. And most of the time that people, when people show us classifying events in a work, work case based on faith, it's assumed this is an average accuracy, right? So I wonder what are the ways that people actually measure long term performance and what, you know, the hidden side of this graph is kind of Oh, we will talk about that in part two. So, yeah, so uh, the question was very good. It was, what's the hidden side of this graph? This feels like a free lunch. How can we be doing so well? Like, what is this not capturing in top line metrics? So we'll talk about that. So that's actually a very good uh, moment to stretch and get uh, have a break, and then we'll reconvene here. How long is the break for? Oh, oh, oh only 10 minutes, okay. <laughs> okay.